Thank you very much, Ria, and uh, welcome everybody to today's session. I'm hoping today is going to be quite a nice, relaxed session, so I hope you've all got a cup of tea and perhaps a sneaky few biscuits um, to help you uh, sort of ease the way a little bit. Um, but we're hopefully going to have a nice session just really talking about literature and talking about the new books that we've got on our course today and answering um, any sort of questions that you may have related to those particular texts. Um, I have two colleagues with me, which I will, uh, who I will introduce now as well. Um, so I've got Andrew Green, if he's, uh, I might get him to introduce himself, um, who um, is going to help uh, and talk about the Shakespeare today. Yes, hello everybody. I've been involved in um, uh, putting together a new um, anthology of critical materials um, in relation to the Shakespeare component um, to begin to think about some issues of diversity um, in terms of critical approaches to the reading of Shakespeare. So I'll be introducing that later on. Nice to be here with you. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And we've also got um, our, our colleague, Sam Prince, who I'm sure most of you have met uh, in, uh, in person or as a, on online events. So I'll just get Sam to introduce herself as well before we start. Oh, hello, I'm Sam Prince. I work for Pearson in the English team and I'm a product developer. So I look after A level, the A level English qualification. So I hope, yes, you might have seen me or seen me in the background supporting on the new to Excel with Emma or the coursework events or if you do Langlit or language, you might have seen me on those as well. So yes, and I have been involved in A-Level for quite a long time now, as I worked on the development way back in 2014 and seeing it through to accreditation. And as it's gone live, I think we're in the, is it the seventh year of the- uh, I know, it's gone. Soon. Time flies yeah. when you're having fun. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is indeed. So, yeah it's really yeah. nice. Um, to join you and thank you very much. I hope this is going to be a useful session about our new text, which we're very excited about in our Excellent. Team. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. So just a couple of little sort of mop up housekeeping things for you. Um, there is a group chat which uh, would be nice to, to use as we're going to be trying to be a bit more webinary and networky today. Um, so if while I'm talking, you want to introduce yourselves or you know, just say hello or uh, make any comments at all in the group chat, please feel free to do so. Um, there is a delegate download for you to use. Um, we don't necessarily need a lot of it today, um, uh, sort of this minute, so you need to go frantically downloading. Um, but um, obviously, do be aware that you, um, if you want the materials for the course, then uh, you know, try and download those 10 different documents that we've got um, which support the course today. Um, and if you have any specific questions, if there's anything like you can't hear or there's um, any sort of technical issues or any questions you would like to ask that perhaps you don't necessarily want everybody to know, um, please do use the Q&A because that um, is a little bit more private and uh, someone behind the scenes will be able to to answer that as well. So um, Liz has said hello, so I'm going to say hello as well. Um, so if anyone else would like to join me and uh, we'll try and uh, get a little discussion going at some point, um, please use the group chat and uh, more than happy to um, take any questions and everything else. And uh, thank you, Sandy, um, uh, here in Dorset. I've just seen you in the Q&A. It's nice to, nice to see you there. So really today, as we've um, sort of just intimated, it really is just about introducing um, our new drama and prose text. So um, we're going to talk about the four different texts um, in turn. And I've got some little videos and little um, clips and things which, fingers crossed, will work. We won't have any technical difficulties. Um, but so um, just to sort of give you some introduction and some background to the text. So we're going to be talking about Les, Les Blanc. Um, as you said, probably not pronouncing it with the, the sort of nuance that perhaps should be there. Um, and sweat. And then we're also going to be talking about home fire and the cutting season. So obviously the first two texts are the drama texts, which are being added to the paper one, um, to the other drama. And then the home fire and the cutting season are being added to paper two, to the prose. Yes, and hello, Kate, from sunny Manchester. I'm in sunny Walthamstow, which isn't actually too bad today, but it's, uh, yes, I, I keep hoping spring is going to be coming to us soon. Um, and hello, Alice from Somerset. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're covering a lot of the UK today, clearly. And then we're going to sort of just actually pause after I've introduced Sam and I've introduced the new texts and actually just think about how you might want to approach them in the classroom, um, what support we have already, what support you feel you might need um, to help with that. And as Andrew has already talked about, um, he's going to talk about the Shakespeare anthology um, that he's um, been able to put together. And I'll also just introduce some resources that we have for the unseen poetry of the coming up. And also, hopefully, it's an opportunity for you to network with other teachers and ask us um, any questions that you have about the AS or the A-level as well. So inevitably, 
we're going to um, be uh, give you some polls to start with, and I will give you a sneaky poll uh, in the middle as well, just to make sure you're all still awake and still with me. Um, that won't be the question, I promise. Um, so just very quickly, um, how long have you been delivering or teaching um, um, A-level English literature? So are you quite new to the course? Is it one to two years or is it more than two years? So if you just want to do a little quick tot up in your head um, and hit submit and uh, we'll see how it goes. These can sometimes either come back blank or come back with slightly weird results. So I'm going to be brave and see. Oh, you're all quite so relatively experienced uh, crowd we've got here, more than two years, and some who are new to the delivery. So welcome all. I don't think it really matters uh, either way uh, when we're having a discussion today, but it's uh, it's nice to know where you all are and uh, all those things. So this is a bit of a loaded question, really, given that uh, what we're talking about the new text. But And please feel free to be honest at this point. Um, how likely are you to switch your text from um, for prose and drama? So are you actually sort of actively looking to switch which is it likely, unlikely, or possibly you might be on a wait and see type thing, um, or you're you know, completely undecided. So sort of put your colours to the mast on that particular one and see what you what you might think. Uh, you might, and then I might ask you again at the end and see how likely, likely you are after that. So I'm just going to flick here. Oh, yeah. So we've got some there. Uh, we've got uh, hopefully some, you know, some some takers and some people that we can uh, cajole into this. As I say, this is the uh, this is the um, the sort of uh, the the event, really, that we're just going to sort of talk you through the text and see uh, if you would uh, if you would like to think about it. Oh, now someone's showing off in the group chat now and saying it's sunny in Rome. So that's, you know, I think that uh, Ruth, honestly. Um, <laughs> so. Last but no means least, uh, which text um, would you can switch teaching? So are you primarily focusing on perhaps I'll change my drama text or my prose text or a bit of both or not quite sure yet? This feels like a, you know, a IQ test. At the, I didn't realize we had these many polls. So there we are. So got quite a few quite not sure. And then the, the drama and then there may be a prose that hasn't quite caught up yet. So we'll uh, we'll doubly check. Um, and then actually while I'm talking and actually I think we've done a bit of this as well, just to sort of um, any key reasons for, for session attendance today. So anything that you really want to get out of today's session, um, please do um, feel free to put that into the group chat. Um, but obviously, I think we'll just keep talking while you're doing that rather than make you speed type um, all of those sorts of things. Yes, I think uh, I think you're uh, I think you're right, Rosie. That if you did switch, it might be drama, given it's one text at, the, at a time um, versus both prose texts. Yeah, I think that's uh, that might be a, a good case there, Rosie. Yes. Right. So I'm going to hand over to Sam just for these next bits, just to sort of um, give you a, no, a break from my voice, if nothing else. But also, Sam will be able to just give you a little bit of background um, around uh, around what's new and around what's uh, what's happening with the specification. Thank you, Emma. Right, I'm in charge of the slides now. Oh, the power. So, first of all, just an overview of the qualification, because I think we did have uh, some new people on board as well as old hats. Can I say that? Is, oh, does that sound wrong? Um, very experienced um, A-level English letters. So, here's what our qualification looks like. So, we've got um, four components. They all do what they say on the tin. We went for a very simple approach when developing it. We've got drama where you do two texts. You've got your Shakespeare and your other drama. There's the prose with the pre-1900 prose and the post-1900 prose. And then we've got the poetry with your post-2000 poetry and the poetry movement or poet. And then the coursework where we have a free choice of two texts there. And we've put AS on there as well. Um, I know A-level tends to be the far more popular qualification, but we have made these changes with the new text to AS as well. So I put that on there just to ensure that we weren't missing out if anybody is doing some co-teaching from AS to A-level. It mirrors A-level quite similarly. There's two components there, the poetry and the drama is put together, and then the prose is exactly the same kind of format as the A-level there. So we did, at that point, make it very co-teachable and nice, and um, but AS numbers have dropped off quite significantly um, in the course of this new curriculum reform. So our D, E and I changes, so diversity, equity and inclusion. I know that some people put them in different orders. I was chatting to a friend at the weekend and her company has them in a completely different order. But that's what that means. And we're very much committed, particularly in our team, to diversity. We made a lot of choices at GCSE, changes at GCSE Lit. We've done it in drama GCSE as well. 
we are committed to being as uh, our DE and I. We've gone full guns blazing. So in order to broaden representation in the qualifications, we decided to remove some texts and make way for some new ones. So they are the paper one in the drama on the section B. We've added, I'm going to go for it, Le Blanc. My French is not very good. I only did it for three years. Uh, but there you go, by Lorraine Hansbury and Sweat. <laughs> I feel like they're two sort of very sort of, you've got Le Blanc, which sounds very sophisticated, and Sweat uh, doing down the <laughs> very sort of uh, binary options going there. And then a prose, we've added two post um, 1900 text. So we've gone for Home Fire by Camilla Shamsi in the colonization and, aft and its aftermath themes, because paper two, prose paper, is all thematic. And then we've gone The Cutting Season by Attica Locke in the crime and detection section theme. So we've got rid of, now this is a good way, I've got to remember what we've got rid of in prose. So it is, we will be removing uh, A Passage to India and it's The Murder Room by P.D. James, A Passage to India by um, A.M. Forster and The Murder Rooms. And you should have, the lovely Liz Slade, who's, uh, who works in the team, is my manager, did get in touch with centres who were delivering those texts that we are removing to give them a heads up. And we also let everybody know in November that this was going to happen. So hopefully this did not be too much of a shock that we are removing two texts for paper two and adding in the prose. Uh, these new prose texts. So for A-level, these texts will be for first teaching this September and then first assessment will be summer 2004, 24, sorry, can't even, gone back in time there. And then for AS, if there is any AS teachers out there, again, you'll be starting this September if you want to come on board with them and then first assessment will be summer 2023. The specs have all been updated. There is a, when you, in your packs, you've got the delegate version um, of the PowerPoint and they are hyperlinked. So they will take you to where the specs are on the website. Hopefully looking all wonderful. And I did do a screenshot from the spec here. I hope it's a little bit, uh, not too small for you to see. So this is how it will look like. We've done a little bit of rejigging of the order. We had a very intense conversation about alphabetical order with the senior principal examiners <laughs> at one point. This is what we've decided to do. We've got rid of the um, tragedy and comedy headings in section B now. They stay in place for, for Shakespeare. But because of the nature of what we were choosing and how it was working, it wasn't going to work to keep those in section B. So we've removed them come September 2020. 22 this September and so slightly different sort of order and it will mean that there's a slightly different impacted question paper order and if you go on to the sample assessment materials there is an explanation of the new word order there and we are going to do some comms about that just to remind you as well in summer that there will be things will look a little bit differently because of the arrival of those new texts for paper two. Um, and paper one, um, I th yes, I think that's right for paper one because we've had to add them in. So there we go. There's uh, Sweat and Le Blanc and some of my old favourites there that I'm hopefully you will be aware of. Here's what prose looks like now um, with the, ad the additions of those two into those two themes. And we're going to start with paper one drama and keep it in our, alph our decided alphabetical order and go for Le Blanc, the whites. We did have a very big discussion about whether the lay was really a the and if it was an article, what we should do with it. Oh, So here we go. Um, oh, this is the overview. I shall run through it quickly, but you can read it through as well later on at your leisure. So it's Lorraine Hansbury's last play, and it was published in 1972, and she actually began writing it in 1960, and was still working on the final draft when she died in 1965. So it was never finished by the actual playwright. And her ex-husband, Robert uh, Nimeroff, we've decided, to, <laughs> that's how I've decided to pronounce that surname, sorry if it's not correct, completed the play based on her drafts. And then it was performed in the 1970s. So the play depicts the lives and conflicts of people living in an unnamed African mission compound around the end of the colonization in the late 19th century. The play focuses on the return of Tshembe Matsoye. That's how I'm going for that 
pronunciation as well. Again, apologies if that is not correct, to his birthplace after he's been living in England with his white English wife and their child. He returns to the funeral of his father and tries to reconnect with his family and his past while struggling to deal with the conflict and violence which has been building up in his absence. The play was Lorraine Hansberry's only play set in Africa. We do have some of her other, one of her other plays on the Lang Litzbeck, A Raisin in the Sun. And uh, through her characters, she wanted to highlight and discuss the different forces and agendas which were facing black Africans as a result of colonization, imperialism and racism. So some very meaty themes there and a very interesting play to choose. So text wise, we've had lots of interesting discussions about this one as well, because it's not straightforward in terms of the texts uh, available, perhaps because of its um, the way it came into existence with it not being completely finished by the playwright and, and it being a sort of the ending being a more of an interpretation of what she was going to get to. So there's the vintage edition, which is a collection. It's not a single text edition. There's a collection. There's some other plays in there. And then Samuel French does have a single edition in there as well. We're having some discussions with another publisher to see if they would do as another um, single text edition, because I know that the, they're aware that the, some of them may be going out of print. So we're just keeping an eye on that. So we'll do any updates for you if we manage to get that organized but both of these versions of the text are available and suitable for use in the classroom we don't prescribe editions for this component so it's perfectly up to you to decide which ones to use the vintage edition more readily available and has a useful introduction as well the samuel french one it, it's there but you might have to be buying um secondhand copies the national theater also did a version of this play i think it was back in Am I, am I right in thinking 2018? I'm popping into my head. I've got that right. Yes. And, and it is available yeah, it on... Them. Yeah. Good. It is available on the National Theatre at Home platform and also Drama Online platform, if any of you have access to those. And this was a play that was based on another adapted version of the text. They were uh, given permission. It was Yale Farber, I think, was the director, and the dramaturg got permission to do a different version based on, again, on um, Hansbury's drafts and notes. So we've got a third version in the ether. Very exciting. I, I do like this about drama, that it can be a very uh, transmutable thing. And also, so students were advised to remember that if they need to refer in the exam, we are talking about the published version of this play, not the um, National Theatre version, which, of course, you, is a great resource to go and, to go and use because plays are meant to be seen on the stage, not sort of read sitting in a classroom. So that's those two in the text. And here are our themes, and this is a still from the National um, Theatre production of Le Blanc. So it's about power and violence. It's conflict, it's colonialism, it's identity, it's family and duty, it's tradition, education. So you have a plethora of wonder to explore in this play. And we've produced guides for each of these plays. Um, Emma did a wonderful job yes. with these. Um, and I think it's just to go back, Sam, just to um, yes. on those themes um, in your pack, um, the guide, we have got versions um, of the guides that were produced. And uh, I, I literally just lifted out the, the themes that I found and put them on these slides. So um, there is some sort of examples of, of those different themes. Obviously, you'll find lots and lots of other themes and lots of other things that you want to um, introduce to your students. So those guides are really not sort of definitive. They are just a nice little launch pad um, and something to get you started. Started. And I will say I did. I have got the version. I was trying to find it while Sam was talking, but I can't find it. I have got the vintage version of the uh, and that introduction um, is really very. It's uh, it's very useful about the play itself and its themes and the things that influenced um, Hansbury, but also about um, sort of her as a playwright and she's a you know a fascinating um, and very influential figure. So um, that uh, that vintage one is, is quite a nice version to use actually um, if you're thinking about uh, covering this particular play. 
um, and the useful links here. Um, there was a bit of a, a bit of googling, I have to admit here, um, around you know, finding some different things. Um, again, it's just to get you started, really. So there's some useful things about Lorraine Hansberry um, as a playwright, as an author, as a, a sort of an interesting individual and an activist. Um, but also, um, I did include quite a lot of the resources um, from the National Theatre because you know this is all something you can think about in terms of AO3, isn't it? About how um, different interpretations and, and how um, sort of you know, a, a text can be uh, reconfigured and rethought about um, uh, over time and uh, in terms of sort of societal and different contextual factors. So there's quite a nice, uh, those links are hopefully um, very useful for you. There's a few little reviews there about um, about Hansbury and about the different um, elements and about her um, a recent biography of her as well. If your if, if your students uh, become interested in in uh, Lorraine as a, a as a figure, I'm using her first name now. I feel like I I know her. So. I've got a couple of little, uh, for each of these, I sort of found a couple of little videos and little things just to sort of introduce you to the, to the, um, to the text. So this is going to be a very quick little clip and I'll, I'll mute my microphone so you don't hear me slurping my tea like a, a, an annoying um, uh, sort of uh, audience member. Um, and, uh, and thinking about, uh, no, just thinking about this is a, a little clip from the, the National Theatre production. And thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I think um, that's included in the guide um, that Hansbury sort of wrote this in a, in a direct response um, to a, to another play that was uh, that was being written at the time, so um, there's, there is really quite a lot of good contextual sort of both literary, um, societal, and obviously historical contextual factors within this play um, that you can really sort of delve into um, around that. So I'm going to click onto the next slide and just um, play you a little clip from the National Theatre production here. She said confidently hoping it's going to work. You are different than when you went away before, Chimby. Inside and out. How do you like my part? Hmm? <laughs> I hope you have not been swallowed up by all the fanaticism. It is everywhere. The killing. You have heard, huh? I have heard. Jimmy, these are new times. They say that there are those in London who recognize that this is our country too. We Right, so hopefully that, I must admit, that did cut out for me. So I'm hoping that didn't cut out for everybody else and it was just my bad internet connection. Um, oh, no, it wasn't you. It, 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 so it wasn't just me, Rosie. Um, we won't worry too much. I think perhaps we're challenging everyone's internet connection with these videos. Um, so uh, all of these videos, the, the links are embedded in your in the PowerPoint presentation um, you will get when it comes through. Um, so um, if you download the PDF, you'll be able to see the video as well. Um, it cut out for me as well. It's a shame, cut off and it's prime. Um, but uh, I think maybe it's uh, the it might be um, various people's internet connections that are, are being challenged. So yes, yeah, sorry about that. Hopefully you got a little a little glimpse of the uh, of the video. Hopefully this isn't going to be a recurring theme. I might have to get my internet hamster to work a little bit faster somewhere. Um, but um, the videos um, are all embedded into the slides. So hopefully, um, if we miss a little bit of it now, um, we'll at least be able to, you'll be able to go back and have a little play of them after that. So just to finish off, really, and bring us back down with a, a bump to earth, really, um, thinking about how this works um, in terms of the questions. So as Sam has already said, we have updated the sample assessment materials. Um, and so you can see there are, um, I put them in your pack, actually, I put the sample assessment materials and I put the EAMS, so the extra assessment materials, um, into your pack. Um, but they are also on the website now. Um, so you can see you know, the sort of questions here. We've got, you know, explore how Hansbury makes use of setting. Um, you must relate your discussion to relevant contextual factors. And likewise, Hansbury's presentation of education. Um, and again, hopefully this will be familiar um, for you. You can see that there's obviously then some indicative content there. 
So again, that can help you if you're thinking about different themes, different characters, different elements to teach your students, um, different um, contextual factors, etc. So um, hopefully that sort of gives you a little flavour um, of Le Blanc. And if it's something that might you feel might interest you and your students, I will say, and I think um, Sam's watched it as well, the, uh, the National Theatre production is very powerful. Um, and is, uh, is uh, although it does, there, there are elements where it does stray from the, the two printed versions of the text. Um, it's definitely worth watching. I think it really does sort of bring home a lot of um, Hansbury stagecraft, actually, doesn't it, Sam? It's, um, it's a very interesting uh, production to watch. Excellent. So, Sam, I'm going to pass over to you. I don't know. I'm hoping uh, internet connections are all still uh, uh, sort of OK and I'm not just talking into the ether. So um, I will I, I will pass over to you, Sam, um, ready to just give a, a little introduction about uh, about sweat. So, Emma, I was just going to say, is it, is it worth just saying that there is so worthwhile watching these drama productions anyway in terms of students oh, talking absolutely. about yeah. talking in terms of context um to, yeah. to, to use viewed productions as context for their own reading as long as they tie it carefully back into the yeah to the published absolutely. text as well yeah yeah and i think as rosie has said it's no it's love that there it's lovely that there is a version available to watch um and i think that's absolutely hit the nail on the head andrew i think it's uh, the fact that you know there is there is this uh, sort of like really sort of uh, well done production and actually relatively recently done production out there but then you can sort of see the the, the sort of um, how how everything still resonates really, um, and from a contextual sort of audience perception point of view, um, I think that's a really good point to make and a really good thing to to think about. Um, so Sam, are, are you are you with us, or have you uh, have you been uh, been cut off? Sam's gone spookily quiet. Yes, yeah, she has gone quiet, hasn't she? It looks like she's disappeared. Um, fine, I Emma. will. I will carry on. It'll be fine. Right. So that was a very brief overview of uh, of the of the first one of the Lorraine Hansbury. So I'm going to move now onto the Lynn Nottage um, play, the, the Sweat. Um, so this is actually a, a, a relatively modern play. This was written in 2014, and it did go on to win the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, um, and has been performed. It was it was very very brief um, in the UK. I think it was at the Royal Court in the UK, or it might have been the Donmar. I may have got my uh, theatres mixed up. Um, but on the website, the Pulitzer um, no, Prize judges you know, are talking about how Nottage's play is nuanced and powerful and reminds the audience of the stacked deck still facing workers searching for the American dream. So I think in terms of context here, in terms of relevancy, um, there's an awful lot for your students to, to build on here. So it's got two settings. Um, so it's got it's 2000 um, and it's um, 2008. Um, so it, um, it's uh, in the Rust Belt town of Reading. Um, and the play revolves around the lives of a group of friends who work um, at a, a steel tubing factory mill. Um, so um, the bar is the main setting. And we can see how the characters are all interacting with each other and how they are talking about their lives and, and how things are, are going on in those sort of first of all 2000, then it's 2008 and it goes backwards and forwards. Um, so although it is obviously set in a very specific time, it does address issues that are affecting everyone, really, particularly you know, sort of maybe even more so now sort of post pandemic or even mid pandemic. Um, so economy, race relations. Uh, workers' rights, relationships, loyalty and regret. So there's uh, there's a lot there for students um, to sort of get their teeth into. Um, so I'm just looking at Amanda's comments here, Andrew. I don't know if, uh, um, I don't know if uh, you want to comment on this, and I can certainly comment. Amanda is saying, somehow I had the idea that unlike previous A-level um, courses I've been involved in, this course didn't really welcome comments on different versions of the play and performance. Um, I'm fairly sure that it was at the start. Um, I'd be delighted to be wrong. Um, yeah, so I was, I I was just typing a... Oh, yeah. sorry, I was, I was just in the middle of typing a reply. I, I think the issue here, uh, Amanda, is that, that what, um, what, what needs not to happen is for the students to start writing solely about the production that they've mm -hmm. seen because they're not being examined on the production that they've seen. They're being examined on the literary text. But in the same way as we, um, you know, students are expected to write about, you know, um, literary context or historical context or social context, um, the viewing of a play is a context for their reading. And um, in the same way as they'd use critical ideas 
or um, you know uh, other contextual ideas to help them form their arguments and their readings, they can use productions that they've seen in exactly the same way by taking it back to the text and talking about how perhaps the pre the the uh, perhaps the, the the costumes that characters were wearing or the ways in which particular characters were presented has helped them rethink what they encounter in the literary text. So in the same way as they'd use any other context, I would suggest that, that you know, it's good to encourage students to talk about their viewing, but not, as I said at the beginning, to then go off on one and start writing yeah. solely about the production that they've seen. Yes, so I think it's, as, as, al as always with the English literature, it is making sure that everything they say is rooted in the text that they are studying. Um, but if there is something in um, the, the National Theatre production, for example, that really resonates, has, no, they've, they've managed to, they've used something from the original text that has been, sort of resonates with a modern audience and how that might be seen now, um, then I think that's, uh, that's a nice thing to think about. But I think it's, uh, no, as Andrew has said, it's always, I think you're right, Amanda, that little bit of caution, um, making sure that students are, I mean, we had this, I mean, this is many years ago um, with GCSE, with the Romeo and Juliet, Leonardo DiCaprio um, one, it's making sure that everything they are saying obviously show them different productions, but the essay they were writing is going to be about the, the, the printed version of the play. Um, so that hasn't changed. But, you know, in order to give them some ideas, some different contextual um, ideas about how the idea, you know, the, the themes of the play are coming across, obviously watching something in action um, is great. Um, and also seeing... Um, seeing how um, sort of the stagecraft of it so that might even fall into their their AO2 um, thinking about how meanings are shaped remembering that these are dramas that sort of really brings it home to them doesn't it as well and you're right Rosie yes the Frankenstein National Theatre version is very different yeah but it's still nice to see it isn't it it's nice to see something being presented and being done well, and that, that, that's a really interesting example isn't it because that really brings alive mm. the idea of this divided character um, and, yeah. and, and that, that question of, you know, who, who, who is the monster here? Yeah. Um, and, and it really brings that alive, that version. And so that kind of quite controversial interpretation can often be quite a good way for students to go back and challenge their reading. Mm, yeah, so I think, you know, it's all, it's all sort of uh, ways to engage your students, isn't it? And different ways to get them to think about these as, especially the drama, I think, um, trying to think of them, remember that these are productions, they are meant to be seen. Um, so if they can see a production, that helps bring it to life, doesn't it, a little bit? So hopefully we're giving you a little bit of an overview there of sweat. Um, those of you who are familiar with Nottage's work um, and actually are familiar with this, um, there is quite a lot of swearing in this, she said, sounding like Mary Whitehouse. Um, so it might be one that you want to have a little read of first um, and see whether it is um, appropriate for your students. Um, it's all in relation to the play and it's all in relation to the, the, um, the elements that are being discussed and the fact that there, it is a, a very sort of tense and, uh, and the, the, the different uh, sort of class and poverty and working environment there. Um, and lots of different themes here, again, uh, change, nostalgia, um, lots of different um, relationships within um, sort of friendships and marriages and lots of different um, sort of elements there. There's the people who are working together, et cetera. Um, work and poverty and status, lots of things around people's identity and actually how that's linked to work and going out to work every day. Um, and um, obviously there are some some elements about race, about um, there's quite a sort of um, lots of different um, uh, sort of uh, political themes coming in there as well. Um, useful links here. Again, it's uh, me doing a little bit of, uh, of Googling and uh, seeing all the different things that we can talk about. Um, so. Um, um, there, the, the, um, the edition of the play, um, the New York um, 2017 one, um, does have a section outlining the production history, does have a brief section about the, about the author, about the playwright. Um, uh, Nottish has done quite a lot of um, different um, interviews where she does reveal um, things that, you know, she's um, talking about her, um, you know, the themes she wanted to introduce. She's talking about all um, sort of the different um, influences she had and the different um, elements um, that, she, that really influenced her. Um, and then we do have some things like some reviews, and it was at the Donbar, I was slightly remembering that. Um, a really interesting article, um, it is, does require a little one-off login, but a really interesting article in the Wall Street Journal about the fact that um, it, um, it's, it's uh, reviewing the Broadway production and arguing that it perhaps explains um, Donald Trump's win in the, in the 2016 election, so quite a lot of linking um, into that. Um, there's quite a lot of... Um, 
re reference to, to NAFTA in the um, and, and things about the Rust Belt within this play as well. So um, we've included some links and some different elements there as well. Um, Stephanie, if you could hear me, um, I know this it sounds like a, 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 I'm saying a very general thing, but actually, if you can uh, just refresh your browser, um, that sometimes jolts the uh, the slide into action, um, so you'll be able to see it then. Um, it happens to to me occasionally as well. Um, so um, if you you might you won't miss anything because it's all being recorded. So if you want to just quickly refresh your browser and come back in, um, hopefully that will allow you to see things and be able to, to um, look at the slides while we're talking as well. Emma, I'm so just I'm going, going to, to say, sorry, Emma, my, my yeah. internet dropped off, so I had an internet mayor then, but I'm, but I'm back. I was going to say there are two productions. There's the John Moore Warehouse production, and then the public in New York did a production, and then we've tried to see if we can get a video recording of those productions, but we've we've hit a blank. So there isn't any um, publicly available recordings of any productions at the moment. But he's hoping perhaps somewhere else will do a production, record it, and yeah, make it available and... for us. Fingers crossed. Yeah, and I know it's uh, it's not quite the same, but um, quite a lot of those YouTube clips that I included do have little snippets um, of the production, um, so little elements that you can see. And hopefully now, um, uh, if, we're, if we're not going to cut out, I might have to change location and go and sit on top of my modem downstairs. Hopefully, um, you'll be able to see a little bit of the of of, of it in action um, in this particular video clip as well. So I'll um I'll t I'll mute my microphone and I'll push this to you, and hopefully we won't get cut off in our prime again this time. In 2011, I read an article in the New York Times which was discussing the fact that Reading, Pennsylvania was the poorest city of its size in all of America. And so we set our sights on trying to get to know the city from top to bottom. We interviewed everyone from the mayor, the police chief, educators, business people, homeless people. They felt that in one fell swoop, they went from being people who were solidly middle class to becoming part of the invisible class. People always answered the question, how would you describe your city, with the answer, Reading was. They always spoke of their city in past tense. How did a city, which had once been such an incredible industrial powerhouse, become a city without narrative? I wasn't sure whether the audience would be offended by some of the representations, but what we found is that people really felt that it was representative of the experience that they had. We've been having the same conversation for 20 years. Hutz is a bitch. Olstead sucks, but it's work. So let's stop complaining and have some fun. It was really important to us to be in dialogue with the folks who were really at the center of the creation of this piece. A lot of us get to a certain point in our lives and sometimes we don't always have a lot to show for that. Because all we have to give is that particular thing that is our eight, 10 hours, whatever, a labor at something that puts food on our table, gives us a sense of identity. And I just wanted to thank you for acknowledging the importance of everybody getting up and going about their day and doing something meaningful. You keeping yourself busy? Trying. Walking the line in the morning, working the phones in the afternoon. Nothing yet. Unions offering money for folks to go back to school. But I never liked school, so I'm taking what little support they give until I can find something to pay the bills. Coming to Reading, one of the things that, that I experienced is that this is a very divided community. It's fractured along racial lines and economic lines, and that a lot of folks are not in dialogue with each other. And what I hope is that everyone recognize the ways in which we're connected rather than the ways in which we're different. People come in here every day. They press by me without seeing me. No, hello, Oscar. If they don't see me, then I don't need to see them. Sitting with the audience in Reading, it really felt like a sacred space. 
we have hit upon something that's quite special and quite important, and I think is at the core of why we continue to make theater. We make theater to create the opportunity for people to sort of reflect back on the culture and to create these sacred experiences in which people can have that catharsis and have that release, and where they can do it collectively with audiences. So there we are. I think I've actually managed to see all of that. So I hope you all did as well. Um, it's quite an interesting little video, that, isn't it? And actually, that woman, when she starts talking, first of all, I can hear her voice cracking. And it makes me feel a little bit emotional as well. You sort of really feel for the um, the people in the audience when they're seeing their what happened to them sort of reflected back at them. Um, so hopefully that was quite just a little a useful introduction um, to the play there. I don't know if any, have anyone has any thoughts about uh that the play or whether they've uh, it's sort of uh, made them think perhaps they'll look uh, further into it it is a uh, it is a, a, a very uh it's a very powerful play, actually. It was uh, one of the ones that uh, we all really enjoyed reading. It's uh, it's uh, it feels a bit bleak when you first start, but there's lots of uh, lots of nuance in it, and there's lots of um, interesting themes to discover in that. So again, hopefully you can see in the in the questions from the Sams and also there's questions from the Eames as well. Um, the sorts of you know, just again, just to give you a little bit of a, a taster, um, looking at the you know the presentation of change um, or looking at Nostra's use of dialogue. Obviously, that you can see even from those little snippets there. That's uh, really quite a nice, uh, rich question um, to be able to answer in an exam. And then again, looking at the indicative content, you can again see the the different um, um, elements and how it's all being interconnected um, within the um, within the, the the indicative content there. And thinking about uh, you know um, uh, the the contextual factors and thinking about the AO2 as well, um, the different elements that you might want to consider uh, when teaching this play. So there we are. We've rattled through the through the drama. I don't know if anyone's got anything they want to put into the group chat at the moment. Um, any any thoughts that they may have had, or whether you want to reserve them all for our, our larger discussion in a moment. Um, but if anyone's got any thoughts, anything that they particularly liked. Um, Yes, I think that's that's true. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's obviously well worth having a read of uh, both. Um, both are are very powerful, actually. They're both um, very interesting um, additions to the spec. I think, um, and it's, I think, um, yeah, particularly sweat um, the fact that it is quite it is really quite recent, um, and I think hopefully, you no, know, it will um, uh, encourage uh, students to think about uh, the contextual elements there. Um, and yes, I think you're right, Kate. It's an interesting recommendation for some of the students' NEA. Um, it's another sort of uh, option to put and think about, isn't it? And uh, actually, it's you no. Know, and you no, know, thinking about uh, thinking about drama in your um, coursework has obviously quite a lot of uh, AO2 uh, uh, different elements there for those uh, sorts of things uh, along there. Right, so I'm going to hand back over to Sam if she hasn't uh, sat, no, fallen down a, an internet uh, hole, um, just to yeah. give us a, a quick little summary of, uh, of Home Fire and to talk about those um, different elements. Yeah, keep, keep your fingers crossed my uh, BT broadband doesn't uh, decide to switch itself off again. Right, overview of this um, novel by Camilla Shamsi. So it was published in 90, uh, sorry, 2017. And it's a novel which won the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2018. And it highlights the concerns and issues faced by Muslims, both in the UK and around the world. So the novel is split into five separate sections and each following the lives and thoughts of a particular character. The narrative is focused on two British Muslim families, the Pasha family, Isma, and her younger twin siblings, and Parvez, have I said that right, Emma? Hopefully I have, or Parvez, um, and the lone family. So. Yeah. And, yes, yes, I've said that, good, good, good. And the lone family, uh, the MP who later becomes Home Secretary, I'm not going to make a comment. Um, and Karim, <laughs> Karamat Lone, his wife's son, his, sorry, his wife, Terry, and his son, uh, Eamon. Or oh, Eamon? Not sure. Yeah, I think that's Eamon. I, I, I would pronounce that as Eamon, Eamon but uh, yes, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's uh, this, no, it, there's, uh, there's obviously, uh, it's, you can see here, there's lots of different characters in this. Uh, that's, I think, one of the, the sort of elements of this, that it's, uh, it's very driven by character. And am I right in thinking it is you loosely based it on Antigone? That's, is, is yes, that right? Yes, it does. I, it's I, uh, it's I, loosely. I um, 
there's quite a lot of um, sort of uh, classical allusion here. They talk about mm -hmm. Icarus a couple of times. So there, it's uh, it is uh, it, it is uh, strongly linked to to Antigone and this idea of uh, bringing bringing someone home um, and yeah. family conflicts and things like that. Yeah. And the, the novel, yeah, brings together a number of characters, like Emma said, locations and events to challenge and correct stereotypes, as well as create an emotive and compelling story of love, identity, family and duty. And the themes here that Emma, some of the themes Emma's pulled out, again, yeah. lots more in your guide. Yes. So um, I sort of bunched them all together, really, um, because they all seem to interconnect with each other. But I think it's you no, know, it's uh, it does sort of pull in on this idea of prejudice and um, sort of uh, religious and racial stereotypes. Um, very, very strong interlinked idea of love and family and this idea of duty. Um, and also, again, idea of you know, uh, nationality and identity and people's uh, different religions and how that shapes all of that. So there's it's there's quite a sort of lots of reoccurring themes within this. Um, it's very interesting from a narrative structure as well and the fact that each um, each chapter is reserved for an individual character. Um, so there's quite a lot to say in terms of AO2 uh, within this particular novel as well. There's lots of um, really quite vivid imagery and um, and she does play around with lots of um, different, uh, especially towards the end, there's sort of newspaper articles and Twitter accounts and, and lots of different elements within that. So it's um, it's actually, uh, we were talking about this uh, in our run through this morning. Um, it's uh, it's a bit like Handmaid's Tale in the fact it's quite, a, it's a very compelling read um, and you sort of read through it, you feel you're reading through it very quickly, um, but actually there is a lot of depth to it and there's a lot um, for students to get their, um, get their sort of their teeth into in that particular um, element there. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's been, a, as you can see, it's got a sort of a, a nice winner sticker on there. Um, it's been quite a popular novel, I think, in inverted commas in that sense. Um, but there is, it, there is quite a lot of depth and a lot of richness to it, which I think hopefully um, your students will enjoy and relate to. Um, and again, thank you, Sam, talking about the Sophocles. There we are. So useful links is how she's um, how she's you know, there's a, a nice little video there. I think there might be a little bit of it here um, where she's discussing her use of the um, the Sophocles play and looking at um, that sort of uh, that phrase she uses a lot in the book about Googling while Muslim. Um, and then she has done another talk um, at the Politics and Prose um, bookshop to an audience again about this particular text. Um, she did lots of interviews, actually. So it's quite useful if you want to have a little bit um a little bit of a sort of a, a little sit with yourself and, and look at and she does talk a lot about the different themes and the lots of uh, sort of things that are coming through um in her novel um she is a regular twitter user as well so and, and does sort of make a lot of um comments about um the things that are going on and everything else so it's uh, there's there's quite a lot of different useful links that you can use here to to get up to date with the with the, the novel and about uh, the author herself as well so this um, this interview is actually very long. It's about nine minutes. So I don't think I'm going to test everyone's patience and internet capacities with that. So I'll play about three or four minutes of it. And then um, um, poor old Camilla, I probably will cut her off in her prime. Um, but uh, obviously, again, the YouTube link is there um, and you can play it in full um, in your own time. But I think um, we'll perhaps just do a little a little snippet of this one um, and then we can move on and look at other things as well. The novel starts with an interrogation scene, with a woman being interrogated at Heathrow um, as she's trying to find out, fly out. She's a British Muslim woman. Um, oh, I think we're working. Let's... Uh... The novel starts with an interrogation scene, with a woman being interrogated at Heathrow um, as she's trying to find out, fly out. She's a British Muslim woman. Um, I've never had quite that experience, but there were a number of years post 9-11 where if you got together enough Muslims, Pakistani Muslims, American Muslims, British Muslims, at some point the conversation would turn to airport interrogations. Um, and I did have for a number of years when I was uh, traveling into America, which I did a lot, I'd be taking the secondary examination room. And it happened the first time because of some computer glitch. But every time I was in that room and I would look around the other people in that room and, and they were inevitably to be crude about it not white um, and you would I would get really nervous and I would play out in my head I would imagine the questions I might be asked 
um, and how I would answer them, even though none of it ever happened. So in some ways, it, you know, that's the start of that novel um, is not something I d directly experienced, but I was made to imagine the experience of it time and time again. My name's Kamila Shamsi, and I've written Home Fire. It's a novel set in various places, but primarily London, also a bit in Massachusetts and a bit in Syria and a tiny bit in Karachi. Um, it's set in 2014 and 15, so it's quite contemporary. And it follows the lives of five, well, broadly speaking, British Muslim characters, although their relationship to that phrase British Muslim varies quite a lot. Um, and it's two families, they're three siblings, and then on the other side of the tracks, as it were, there's the Home Secretary and his son. Um, and it's really what happens when these lives collide, and, and in the backdrop of it is the fact that the three siblings in question, their father was a jihadi who died on his way to Guantanamo. So, of course, that sets up the two families against each other. Sometimes you get very lucky as a writer because you're without a novel to work on and someone hands you an idea. Um, in my case, I was between novels. Um, I was at that point where I really wanted to know what the next novel was going to be, but I just had nothing in my head. Um, and I got an email from a man I had never met um, called Jitinder Verma, who runs the Tara Arts Theatre in London. Um, and he invited me for a coffee. And when we met, he said, uh, I really love your novels. I love the way you do dialogue. I want you to write a play for me. And I said, but I don't know how to write a play. And he said, yes, I thought you'd say that. So why don't you adapt a play? Something like Antigone. Um, he said, you know, I think that's really a play you could do a lot with. And if you could just think about some contemporary Asian or British Asian context for it, just go away and think about it. Um, and I said, all right. And I thought, you know, I do love the theatre, but I knew that I have no idea how to write this. I have no idea how to write a play. And I went away and I reread Antigone, which I hadn't looked at since I was at university and only dimly remembered. And very quickly, I came to see how I would want to transpose a contemporary story onto it, because it is, among the many other things it's about, it is also what happens when an individual takes on what they think of as an unjust edict by the state. And, of course, any state is going to... Emma, I can't hear you. Is it just me? I think... Oh, no, you're sorry, muted. that's me. I've, oh. I was giving you all chapter and verse about how I change right. locations and everything else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so enough. I'm nearer my modem now, so hopefully you can see. I've just turned the washing machine off and run down the stairs. So hopefully uh, this, is a, this doesn't seem as chaotic as it... It doesn't feel as chaotic as it seems. Um, but I think hopefully you've seen... Uh, it's, she's a very eloquent speaker, isn't she? And it's uh, um, all this, you know, going for coffee and being asked to write a play um, is, a, is a very interesting sort of backstory and that that interview is, is quite long but it is very interesting it does give you some some insight into the text um, I'm conscious of time actually I know um, a lot of you wanted to talk to Andrew about the Shakespeare so I'm going to sort of uh, try and get a little bit of a wriggle on now um, so again you can see um, there's the questions from the sample assessment materials sample assessment materials and the Eames are in your pack um, and then also you can see the indicative content is there as well um, so last but by no means least um, is uh, the cutting season um, and Sam I'll quickly run through this one because as I say I'm conscious that we're getting on to nearly five o'clock and we're perhaps um, running out of time. I said to Sam today I said this will either last 45 minutes or we'll be absolutely struggling to uh, get it all in for an hour and a half and I'm worried we're now the latter. Um, so the Attica Locke novel, I must admit, she's, this is a, a novelist I hadn't had um, a lot of, uh, I didn't know a lot about until this was suggested by, uh, by um, one of the team. And it's, it's actually a, a really fascinating novel. Um, it's, uh, obviously, it's set in um, Louisiana and it's, in, it's set in a plantation. Um, and so it obviously allows the, the reader to gain insight into the lives of the workers on the plantation. But it does also have this idea of a past and a present. Um, so it then allows, obviously, to explore the legacy of slavery and how it, those attitudes are still affecting modern America and it's uh, no, linking to modern day issues and inequalities. Um, so it obviously, as we got it as part of our crime and detection, it is about a death. It's about the death of a migrant ver um, 
worker whose body is found on this plantation. Um, and then it's you know, and it's been redeveloped to be an educational center. And Karen is the is the main protagonist here. She is the manager of the uh, the venue, and she has some very strong links to um, the Bell the Bellevue. And it's uh, she isn't a detective, but she is is part of this and is part of thinking about all of those different um, those different elements uh, there. So it is obviously about it is a crime and detection novel. There is a, a definite though victim and a definite and a, an array of suspects but there's it's also talking about race and politics and law and injustice um, and how many of those are actually obviously inevitably um, linked to the past as well so um, it's a, it's a very uh, a, it's actually quite a, a consuming novel it's a very interesting novel to to have a read of um, obviously you might want to have a look at it before you introduce it to your students but lots of different themes here again past and present family and duty work and community race and injustice, no, and obviously inevitably law and order and the idea of crime um, and all of those different um, factors there as well. Again, some useful links for you to have a look at. Um, being able to know, there's um, she um, Attica Lock has her own website, and actually, then if you go onto that link, um, she does talk about um, what influenced her and the fact that she, I think, she went to a plantation for uh, for a wedding, um, and sort of got the idea of, you know, of, of, of uh, what inspired her to write it from there. Um, and she obviously took, has taken part in some conferences and given some interviews, um, both to you know, sort of the press and also on video. So hopefully, there's some some nice little um, things for you to look at there as well. Um, I have included, it's very long actually, so I don't think I'm going to play it. Um, there is a, a podcast here um, where she is talking um, to uh, the Los Angeles Review of Books um, about specifically about the cutting season. It is about an hour long. Um, so if you've got a car journey coming up or something like that, um, I'd recommend having a little listen to that. Um, but again, she does talk about her influences. She does talk about what um, sort of made her write this particular novel. Um, she does, uh, she has written quite a lot of um, uh, different crime novels and different um, sort of you know, focusing on lots of different themes and things. So um, it's well worth investigating her in more detail as a novelist. Um, and I'm no, sorry, I feel like I'm giving her a little bit of short change here, but I'm a little bit conscious that we're, we're running out of time a little bit here. And yeah, thank you, Kate. It is an interesting choice. It was, um, it, we spent a lot of time trying to sort of um, think about the different um, novels that uh, we could include in, in this particular one. And I think this is, um, this is a, a very, it's a very interesting read. And it's uh, it, the fact that it is uh, sort of, you know, does have these echoes of the past. Um, and it's perhaps not a traditional crime novel in that sense, but does still have quite a lot of the sort of elements of of a crime and detection um, novel it makes it a very interesting read and a very uh, good one to think about. And again, you can see how um, we've um, we've uh, updated the sample assessment materials and the extra assessment materials to include um, our new text here. So you can see um, how it's fitting in with Lady Audley's Secret and the Moonstone um, and In Cold Blood. And those are the two um, the two questions and there is the up, um, updated indicative content as well. So there's four questions there for you to have a look at with the indicative content um, to be able to think about the different um, elements that you might want to look at. And hopefully the guide will give you um, a useful um, sort of springboard and a useful um, thing to actually get you started. As I say, it's a very it's a relatively brief guide, but it's just to sort of give you um, a few ideas perhaps before you even start reading just to see if they're um, suitable for your students and any something that you you think uh, would be interesting either for this particular um, paper or as someone has already mentioned you know, to perhaps uh, in involve students with their, their NEA as well. So in terms of support for this, um, obviously we do have some resources. And again, as Sam has said, um, these are, when you get this, you'll be able to click on these links and use them. But I have also included them all in your download pack. Um, so there's the sample assessment materials there. Um, and we've also put, I think I've put the specification in there as well, and the new specimen papers, and also the introductory guides that I've been talking about are under the heading guide. So hopefully fairly self-explanatory, um, but we have included those in your pack. Um, so hopefully Hopefully you'll be able to get your hands on those um, and be able to have a think about that. Um, it's probably not a good time to be doing it now, but uh, it might be uh, over the summer or something like that. You want to have a little, a little think and a little read about your, uh, your different texts and thinking about that. 
So just a very quick discussion, really. I know we've been having a little bit of discussion on the group chat um, as we go. And I'm going to put a poll in first just to see if, uh, if anyone's changed their mind. Um, so are there any of these texts um, would you now consider teaching? I realise we've given you probably a very whistle-stop tour um, about these. But has anything sort of particularly struck you as sort of you know, striking your fancy or something that you thought, well, I wasn't going to do that, but actually now I'm quite interested. So if anyone wants to say any of the texts that they now think they might be interested in teaching and again do feel free to say none or you're undecided it's uh, you know we're not expecting you to make um, a massive decision now um, but just to you know for our interest and just to see uh, if your if your thinking has changed um, after what we've been talking about today so I'll let you have a little a little click and a little think um, and see what you think. Oh, it's quite good. We've got quite an even split there. Um, so that's uh, hopefully that's given you a nice little overview. And actually what we sort of wanted to do um, is just actually is there no if there's anything in the group chat you want to um, discuss, is there um, no, anything that uh, you think would be a particularly um, appeal to your students? Is there an element there? Um, how would you introduce it into your teaching plans? Um, any other comments about it? Um, and those sorts of different things there. And yes, I think it's, uh, it's right. Um, I think you're right. It's hard to let go of the text that students love. And, and also, you know, you've got, you, you're feeling comfortable with your, um, you're feeling comfortable with your texts, aren't you? And it, there's been a lot of upheaval over the over the sort of last couple of years. So, but hopefully this is uh, food for thought um, to be able to, to get to you. And thank you, Sandra, saying it sounds fascinating, uh, making a choice that's difficult. Yes, I think it might be. Yeah. Um, and as uh, as Andrew said, thank you, Andrew. Andrew is uh, is uh, very well read on the crime and thriller. Um, that it's uh, all does lots of interesting things. The cutting season to crime and thriller the formats. There's lots of uh, um, sort of. Uh, um, at different elements and different voices that are coming through into the cutting season. Um, and yes, I think, you know, if you if you are worried about making a choice, obviously, these are all options for NEA, um, as long as you are not obviously putting them in your students in for assessment of these um, into the other um, sort of into the drama or the um, the prose unit as well. So hopefully um, this is giving you some nice um, food for thought. Um, and think about uh, all of those sorts of things. And yes, Home Fire is getting a, a little bit of a thumbs up here. Um, as, as they're thinking about that, maybe a, um, an, an interesting one to introduce to your students. Uh, it might be Samantha, you want to have a little bit of a, a little bit of read um, first to see what you think. Uh, it's uh, it's actually um, it's a I don't want to say easy read because it isn't an easy read, but it's um, it's uh, I read it was it was really quite a, a new, sort of a page turner. It does sort of make you. Um, it's a it's a, a very sort of uh, easy to follow narrative and it sort of keeps you on the on the edge a little bit as wondering what's going on. It's a uh, it's very well uh, sort of narratively constructive. Oh, the cutting season. Excellent. Nice to see there might be some cutting seasons here. Um, and uh, and yes, uh, Stephanie, if you're, you know, your students are mostly Muslim, then that will uh, that will work well um, and uh, hopefully uh, give them some little things to think about. Um, and Ruth, yes, absolutely. I know if you've had lots of change already, um, you know, try and stick to some some current texts, uh, for, uh, do them once more. But again, uh, when you've uh, sort of uh, taken a breath uh, after your spec change, um, then obviously these are these are available to you to have a think about and see uh, see whether um, so, uh, your students would uh, enjoy any of these. Um, Andrew and Sam, I don't know if you've got anything you wanted to to add to the discussion here, um, uh, either Somebody by was typing just away. About the US, weren't they? I don't think that was a conscious choice. That we were the the principal, the principal examiners, and our credible specialist, which Emma and Andrew and Esther Menon, who some of you may have uh, come across as well, who does training for us, they were all doing the the, the reading, and there were some great texts that were read, but they just weren't going to work in terms of for assessment. Um, there was a very strong flavour for paper one from the principal examiner and who's the chief examiner as well, that we wanted women because we've only got Afro Ben. So she's been dead a very oh. long time. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I don't think it was a conscious decision. It was just that. No, actually, now you've out. said that, I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just one of those things that, um, and we did consider a lot of, yeah, homegrown plays. and There was a lot novels. of play reading, I will say. Yes, we yeah. did a lot of play reading in particular. Um, so and yes, it, they they just seemed the most appropriate um, no, in terms of, and particularly with the prose as well, it's how well they will fit in with the other texts. 
Um, so there's yes. obviously that to consider as well. Um, so um, yes, if there's you know, um, obviously if you do have any authors that you would like to um, think about with your students, obviously that's the beauty of the NEA, isn't it? That uh, no, if there's um, uh, you can start to include that and you may want to use one of these texts and then introduce another another maybe a British author along with this as well so there's hopefully um, not only for the unit one and unit two there is some 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 ideas here for your NEA work as well. I was going to say we nearly had Nine Night by Natasha Gordon was a very strong contender and Winston Pinnock I think it was leave taking wasn't it by Winston Pinnock so there yeah. were some um, black British play, female playwrights that, that were nearly there uh, and then we sort of had a bit more discussion and sort of looking at as sort of the broader rep as broader representation as we could get so yes there was a lot of sort of it was it took us a long time to do all this deciding and I think yeah. it's just a yeah, bit and we thought we made a decision and then we had um, yeah. yeah so it's it was interesting but we we hope everybody's happy with these choices and they are offering something different to, to students and to you as teachers as well fingers crossed. Yeah and I think Stephanie and again Sam you may want to pick up on this um, about the availability of the text. It is um, Le Blanc um, I, I certainly had no issues um, getting it from um, Amazon um, so I think um, it may well be that and, and I think Sam is working very hard to make sure there is a no we are we are having enough versions there but the other three um, are as far as I am aware and Sam may correct me are completely and totally readily available to buy um, from, yeah. from all good bookstores yeah we have to make sure they're not too prohibitively expensive and I'm going to <clears throat> excuse me pick up with Nick Home Books who's the publisher we've been talking to to see if we could get a, another version of Le Blanc printed. So uh, watch this space. Hopefully I will pick that up with them and see if we can persuade them to do as a nice version, a uh, student-friendly version as well. So fingers crossed. Yeah, and Kate, thank you for your comment. You know, I think it's always, no, as you, you know, it, you feel like if you do feel like you're dealing with a lot at the moment, um, but yes, you no, know, perhaps a little bit of bedtime reading um, and then think about introducing it when you can, and I say if, if or when, um, you can see the wood for the trees a little bit. You know, we are aware that uh, it's been quite a, how should we put it, tactfully challenging uh, few years, hasn't it? Uh, well, twas ever thus in teaching, I think. But yes, I think um, hopefully this has at least given you a little bit of food for thought for the future if not necessarily thinking oh goodness I don't think I can change it now so um, hopefully there is some no, some different options for you there. Right I'm going to stop talking and actually let Andrew um, take the floor now because I'm conscious that we are at seven minutes past five and I want to give him a good run so to speak um, at talking about the uh, the Shakespeare anthology so I'll hand over to Sam I think first isn't it and then Andrew to just um, talk you through the, uh, the the new Shakespeare anthology. Yes, I'm just going to read the slide. So um, the, this slide is just a bit of a rationale be, behind what what we did and how we broaden those horizons. And if anybody's thinking, well, what about the poetry paper? We did consider what to do about poetry. And in our investigations, we found that a lot of centres do their pre-1900 choices in poetry. So actually, if we added another movement or poem, poet, sorry, there, that might not have the impact we wanted. And we do have the contemporary anthology there that's helping us to sort of bring in contemporary, contemporary, can't talk, um, poetry there. So that's why we decided just to do the drama and the prose. But then we thought, hang on a minute. We also had the issue that obviously Shakespeare is always going to be a white man from the Midlands. That isn't going to change unless the you know, we start doing time travel. But then we thought, oh, hang on, what can we do for those sections of uh, the drama paper and the poetry paper where perhaps we're not offering any representation and broadening out here? So then we had, and I don't remember who had this wonderful idea, but we suddenly, it, it came upon us we could do some more additional anthologies for the Shakespeare to go with the, the ones that we offer you already and uh, an additional poetry anthology as well to, to join the preparation and seeing poetry preparation anthology. It's a bit of a mouthful, that one. So that's the background to, to behind these two additional bits of work we, you know, we have done. And I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who worked on the Shakespeare and Diversity additional anthology that we've produced for Shakespeare. Andrew, over to you. OK, thank you, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to pick up, first of all, on a, a point that um, was on the previous slide, that there's no intention that this um, new anthology replaces the existing anthologies on tragedy and comedy. This is very much uh, seen as something that sits, uh, sits alongside those and, and adds to those in terms of 
um, giving an indication of the kinds of critical material that it would be interesting for uh, for centres to engage with. Uh, because obviously, you know, um, when it comes to thinking about diversity, it's not only about the text. Um, that are studied themselves, the ones that we've looked at this afternoon, for example. It's also about the ways in which we approach, um, uh, you know, more traditional canonical texts as well, and the ways in which our ability to read those has changed over time. And so it was felt, um, you know, important to develop an anthology of critical materials that would reflect that kind of, you know, uh, d diversity of perspectives when it came to thinking about the texts that sits beyond the idea of tragedy and comedy. Um, we have existing uh, anthologies on tragedy and comedy, and these are intended to be, um, you know, ideas and approaches to text that could work whether you're working with tragedy or comedy on the Shakespeare. Um, and so this anthology was put together. And, and it's important to say as well that the anthology is like the, um, the tragedy and comedy ones, not a set text. Um, this is a, a, you know, intended, if you like, to be a kind of, you know, indication of, of, of useful materials, um, which you are, at all, of course, totally free to use. But it might just give an indication of the kinds of things that it's useful to um, work on with your students. And it can be used as well as or instead of um, other critical materials. And indeed, those other critical materials can be used, um, you know, totally instead of any of the anthologies. The, the issue is that you're thinking with your students about how to use critical ideas to read the text. But this new anthology is, is, is devised to give you a guide of the kinds of ways that you might think about these, um, these questions. And so um, when I was asked to do this, I began to think about a range of good ways of reconsidering considering what we find in these plays and, and focus down on four, because of course there are many different ways that we could have approached the issue of diversity um, in Shakespeare, but given their, their kind of um, prevalence within the critical literature available and their kind of general usefulness, we came down to four sections to work on, to think about gender approaches, um, to think about how sexuality is represented in the, in the plays, to think about issues of ethnicity and also, um, interestingly, disability. Uh, there's, there's quite a growing body of um, critical material that looks at the idea of, of ableness and differently ableness, um, if that's a word, within the, um, uh, within the, the, the critical readings available of Shakespeare. And so um, the, the anthology was put together. Um, maybe we could um, just move on to look at the next slide. Um, whoever has control of the slides, please. Lovely. And so what you can see there is one page from the anthology, um, which uh, gives an idea of the coverage of the different texts. And so as a principle, um, we took the view that there should be at least, um, you know, at least one um, at least one piece that would specifically address each of the plays and where possible to, to get a couple that would help us to do that, but equally to make sure that we had a range of coverage across those different theme areas. Um, there are extracts within the anthology that are general in their nature. There are kind of overview passages that might be applied to the study of any text. But equally, we have specific examples that relate to the individual plays. So, for instance, you'll see, therefore, of Anthony and Cleopatra, we have an approach that looks at the whole idea of the character's ethnicity and the ways in which that is represented and considered in the play. Um, we also have, um, you know, for example, with relation to disability, um, some interesting readings of King Lear, um, for obvious reasons, with the idea of blinding uh, in that play and the way in which the the removal of the uh, of Gloucester's sight proves to be a particularly you know interesting issue in the play, and so we looked to develop this kind of range of approaches to thinking. This isn't intended to be exhaustive by any means. Um, and you will find that there is much more material available. But this is an interesting way into beginning to think about these issues with your students. Just to say one, one obvious omission looking in that, um, that, that table there is the issue of ethnicity in relation to the comedy. And that's um, because having looked very hard, um, the comedies that are set there um, tend not to be um, uh, plays that deal with issues of ethnicity. And therefore, 
that's something that is largely absent there. However, an interesting way of looking at this is to see where different productions, we've talked about productions before, have um, used actors who are from, you know, different ethnic and minority backgrounds to play particular characters and the ways in which that might have a particular effect and the way that that might in itself be a critical statement in relation to those other plays. So, an anthology of this sort of obviously can't cover all of the bases, but it's intended, as I said, to be an introduction to thinking about the use of um, this kind of material in relation to Shakespeare and to contribute to the debates that you might have with your students. So I will stop there and see whether there are any questions that anybody might have about this, um, this aspect of, of, the, of the new materials. There was one asked on the Q&A from Charles was asking about if students can use this additional anthology when they're talking about their AO5 in the exam, which is perfectly wonderful to do. And I just, it was a really good question. Absolutely. So I'm, I might actually talk to uh, the principal examiner and see if we can update the indifficult content with some of these references in, or perhaps we could do some additional bit of work to show that these are perfectly acceptable to be used, um, just like any other sort of different interpretations. Certainly, and, yeah, and just... of course, I mean, students are free and, and centres are free to work with um, with materials that aren't on that aren't covered in the anthologies, even um, that are um, you know that, that that are simply things that the teachers feel might be useful and interesting for their own students, and those are all totally available to students to use in their examination to cover the AO five component. Yeah, and if you uh, want to have a quick look, I think I wrote this pack thinking we'd have all the time in the world to have a little skim read and do things, but I don't think we do now. Um, that the, um, the anthology is actually in your pack. It's document 10, um, but it's also um, on the website as well. So um, obviously, before you go, make sure that you've downloaded everything that you would need um, to be able to include this anthology. You may well have already found it. I think it's been on the website for quite some time. Um, and I think, um, Sandy, we answered uh, your, your question, didn't we? about the anthologies yeah, so can this we use summer. The anthologies this summer? Uh, yeah, I, I would see absolutely mm. no reason why not. Yeah. Excellent. I realise that we've probably bombarded you with a lot of information today in a very short amount of time. So um, obviously, it's just that was just a little introduction to tell you um, what's coming up in turn. No, what's on the website now. Um, and then just another little thing. I'm going to touch on this very briefly um, to say that we have got um, another po an additional unseen poetry preparation anthology um, that Sam is putting the final touches on now um, and will be available as soon as possible and definitely this is very no you're nailing your colors to the mask here, I've, Sam. Now, I have, uh, I've done it now haven't I <laughs> yeah and we'll definitely be ready for World Poetry Day on the 21st of March so all set your yeah, watches right. ready for that um, so there's obviously again it's a it's an anthology which gives uh, will have a range of contemporary poems in there well you know, we've finally you know, clearing copyright as we speak um, to help prepare for the unseen element of the course. Um, and Esther Menon, who wrote this, has also included some activities and some exam style questions linking, um, oh, sorry, linking, the, I'm going to go back, linking those um, poems to the prescribed poem from the poem of the decade. So that will be, when it's available, um, obviously I think Claire Haviland will send out a little update as well. Um, it will be available under the anthology heading um, of the course materials ready for you to download. Um, but just very quickly, I'm not going to read these out particularly because I don't want to be uh, sound cap saying particular swear words over the uh, over the airways um, but here are all the um, here are the, the different unseen poems um, that uh, are going to be available um, within this anthology um, for you to be able to you know there may be some that you might want to skim and some that you want to focus more on but they're as you can see a nice really wide range of poems and a wide range of poets as well um, to be able to get that and hope and as Rosie is saying it's uh, hopefully be able to give you some some food for thought for the the unseen poems and to see them you no know, linking ideas with the the poems of the decade anthology um, and here is just an example of one of the activities so if we um, look at one of the poems there was The Missing, um, the Roger Robinson, um, you can see here how it's that there's some things to, to help guide students through the poem. Um, so, you know, even though it comes from a real event, um, it's um, presently um, a surreal um, 
uh, perspective, um, straddling the harsh reality of the Grenfell disaster um, and also um, thinking about you know, pinpointing the tone of the poem, which is always you know, something that's um, an important thing for students to, to think about. And then actually, I think that's quite a nice, helpful tip, isn't it? That you know, just uh, because the topic of the poem is about loss, doesn't mean that it's necessarily sad. Uh, no, just no, think about no, the, the different um, emotions, the different tones um, that are coming out in the poem there. And again, as we said, we are going to, there are some, some, quite some exam style questions which are going to link the unseen poem in the anthology to one of the ones um, that's in the, um, the, the anthology, the, the, the forward poetry anthology. So hopefully um, this is a, a really nice little extra resource for you to have um, that Sam is going to beaver away on and get that ready um, uh, very, very shortly from there. And I think you're right, Sandra. I think, you know, um, um, given that I know the, the, the poetry anthology is good for, for students who may well have uh, not done so much poetry at GCSE um, and you've been making an anthology of your own. I think a lot of teachers have been doing that. So hopefully um, the arrival of this anthology will also um, help that and save you a little bit of work as well. Um, so uh, that will be ready by the end of the month to be able to download and to, to use um, with, your, uh, with your students as they're coming onto their, onto their A level. Oh, so there we are. So hopefully that has given you a lot of food for thought. And as I say, it was, uh, as you can see, by me moving locations and you know, not being able to play videos, I was a little bit more relaxed than perhaps some of the training events that we, we would normally run. Um, but hopefully that's given you some, um, some nice um, ideas and some nice food for thought um, um, around the new text and around some, some new support that we have coming up as well um, to help you uh, with the requirements of the, uh, the different requirements of the A-level and also to sort of uh, um, in, you know, encourage uh, diversity uh, within the curriculum um, as much as you can to help engage your students as well. So just some really basic other useful information. Um, obviously, um, Claire Haviland, I, I always hope she doesn't listen because I often describe her as lurking in the undergrowth of this picture. Um, but she is obviously um, a very, very useful resource um, to have. Um, and uh, no, she was a, a, an English teacher and a head of department. She knows all the specifications inside out and back to front. Um, so any um, information you require um, up, up previously to this course, obviously do let her know and, uh, and uh, stay in contact with Claire um, around what I know is going to be a busy time coming up for you. Um, just some very quick little ones. I'm going to skim through all of these. Um, I'm sure you probably all know about Results Plus. So when um, your students get their results in um, in August, hopefully you can log on to Results Plus and uh, use that for tracking your um, progress. We do also have the mock service. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, and when you get these slides, you'll be able to see um, all the details um, available for that. Um, but obviously, um, you can um, no, take um, uh, a note of this should you wish to. It's obviously a paid for service, um, but um, there's lots of that. Uh, you can um, get your students' mocks marked at certain times. And there's some information there about how it works um, and also you know, how you'll then get some uh, results analysis to help um, with your students there. Um, so if you do want to take part in the mock service, I'm skimming over that because I'm not particularly conversant in it, I have to admit. Um, so there are the slides there, should you wish to have a look at those. And also, should you wish to you know, want to sit indoors over the summer and look at a computer screen, um, there is also an opportunity to, um, to do some marking. Um, all joking aside, and I know um, Andrew is a marker as well, um, at, at, as is how he, does the, he does some of the marking over the summer. Um, it is um, a, no, a good CPD for you um, to, to um, take part and become an examiner um, so um, should you wish to do that um, then obviously do um, follow the the links and follow the different um, ways to, to to apply to be an examiner there as well um, and if you want to do any more training obviously the Pearson Professional Development Academy um, do log into that see what's coming up in the future um, ready for a level or indeed if you're with us for GCSE um, see what's there for the GCSE courses as well um, so I don't know if anyone else any of my colleagues, I'd well, rattle through that, want to say anything else. So, Sam, I'll let you talk. Sorry, Emma. I was just going to say, we are considering a summer webinar as well, which perhaps will focus on the additional poetry and Shakespeare anthology. So that is possibly something we're going to offer in the summer to go look at those through in more detail. So if that's something that sounds good, it might be interesting to, to let us know. Or We're always open to ideas for webinars, what's going to be helpful to support your teaching. But if uh, you can always email uh, me or, or come through Claire and she can pass them on to me. But yeah, that's what we're thinking at the moment. That'd be quite useful to have another yeah, bit more of an in-depth look. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of questions, Andrew. I don't know if you want to answer these as you are an examiner or whether um, it's better to go to Claire. Um, but a couple of questions from, from Rosie and from Kate um, about an examiner. Um, examiners. I don't know whether you can throw any light on that, Andrew, as you are a, 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 a marker. Right, hold on. Let me just take a look at the questions and we'll we'll have a look. Yeah, so it's, it's Rosie about asking about... Um, and uh, Rosie asking about request-specific text for the marking. Right. Um, the, the answer, no, no I, I don't believe you can request specific texts. I believe if you're appointed as a marker, the expectation is that you would be able to mark across the paper. Um, however, I do know that on occasions they ask for preferences. However, the expectation going in should be that you were able to mark across the paper. Um, in terms of experience, I think it would be a case of actually, um, you know, making the application to the um, to see whether or not that's something that they are particularly keen to look for. Though everybody has to start somewhere, don't they? Um, no, no, nobody walks in experienced, do they? So, yeah, um, absolutely. So I, yeah. Um, yeah. However, so I think, however I think... obviously, what they would expect is um, familiarity with the specification and the ways in which the assessment works. Yes, and I think um, a certain number of I think a, a teaching no being a teacher um, obviously is the is the the number one as well I think isn't it Yeah. Yeah. So again, Andrew and I, uh, uh, please don't necessarily take our word for it. Uh, the, uh, if you go onto the onto the website and uh, there is a, sort of a fairly basic um, form to fill out uh, with your experience and your uh, um, you know, sort of what uh, what you are uh, sort of the, the requirements and things. So um, there is a formal process to go to. So um, if you are interested and it's nice to see some questions coming up about that and people are interested, um, do please um, go to the website. If you don't have any luck and finding it on the website, Claire Haviland will definitely be able to help you with that. Um, so thank you very much for those questions. It's nice to see uh, people thinking about being examiners and being markers and, uh, and getting involved in the summer. So I think that's it. I say the darkness is coming into my house. Uh, so it's the trouble with a, a, a terrace house. I now look like I'm sitting on my own in the dark talking to myself. Um, so thank you all very much for coming today. And thank you so much to um, Andrew and Sam for your, all your input and for um, helping with the discussion. And it's been really nice seeing all your comments on the group chat. So um, thank you all very much for your input today. And I hope that was uh, interesting and useful. And also um, good luck in the summer. And I hope everything goes, uh, goes well uh, this time term and then the lead up to it so um good luck and i'm sure we'll see you all soon hopefully for a summer webinar bye everybody thank you thank you everybody